I've been into bugs since I was, before I can remember. I mean, when I was five, I was collecting carpenter ants in little styrofoam cups, and I had uh, tanks of ants on the shelves, and uh, my dad and I kept bees when I was a kid, and, and then I just basically never grew up. The real danger to people are the social insects. So these are the insects that live in these large family groups. These are the insects that have individuals that are willing to take big risks uh, for their colonies. So honeybees, yellow jackets, ants, particularly fire ants, it's these insects that live in large colonies. Um, there are a lot of, of insects and, and arachnids and spiders that can sting, but most of those uh, are ones uh, where you really have to go out of your way to provoke an individual to sting. Uh, so I would worry mostly about the, the social insects here. The big one is your friendly, fuzzy, local neighborhood honeybee. I know we love honeybees for the pollination services and we, we love the honey they produce and they're very charismatic animals, but they can also be very defensive when their nests are bothered. And colonies of honeybees can have 10,000, 20,000, up to 50 or 60,000 individuals. And when a colony gets bothered, they can, they can mount a pretty serious defensive response that involves flying some distance from their hive to um, dissuade what they see as a threat to their colony. Uh, and here in central Texas, we also have um, this more recent invasion of a tropical subspecies of honeybee that's sometimes called the Africanized bee. And this bee is a honeybee. Its biology is similar to other honeybees, but it uh, mounts uh, a more aggressive response to, to perceived threats than uh, our more traditional European strains of honeybees. And that's one of the main, uh, one of the main dangers. Uh, Central Texas also has a wonderful diversity of native wasps, and uh, these can be anything from the little paper wasps that have little nests under the eaves to larger hornets and yellow jackets that live in, in larger colonies. And as the season goes by, these are, uh, these are annual colonies that start small and get big. Towards the end of the summer, these colonies of, of paper wasps get large enough where they're liable to be more defensive uh, about threats to their nests. And so those are also another, another risk. The primary danger with stinging insect venom is not the toxicity per se, but the chance of an anaphylactic allergic response to the sting. So toxicity itself is sort of a tricky thing to measure because there are different ways to approach it. The, there's also the trouble that there are many thousands of different species of bees and wasps and they all have uh, sort of different recipes for their venom. Um, and so we can say that some wasps you know, have more of this chemical and some have more of that. Uh, but basically, the main danger remains an allergic response rather than an acute toxicity. The only time when the toxicity really comes into play is when the number of stings is such that an individual um, who's getting stung gets a lot of venom. And this typically happens with Africanized honeybees, but not too much with any of our other local insects. So the social insects, the primary purpose of their venom is to inflict pain. The whole reason why they sting is they do not want a large, potentially dangerous mammal like us getting into their nest and eating their honey or making off with their, their brood. So they have a venom that's designed to be painful. So when they sting you, they're injecting these little proteins that know just how to latch on to the pain receptors. As a result, wasp stings and bee stings can really hurt. The good news is, these venoms are designed to inflict pain, but they aren't necessarily dangerous other than that. Once they've convinced you to move away from their nest, then, then they're okay. Uh, the danger again comes when you're in a situation where you've perhaps bothered a nest of Africanized bees and then can't get away. Um, a typical example is you step in a hole in the ground that's got a nest of them and twist your ankle so you can't 
move. That's, <laughs> that's the kind of situation where Africanized bees become dangerous from a toxicity, uh, toxicity standpoint. It is worth remembering that none of these bees and wasps uh, and, and ants are out to sting you on purpose. They don't do it unprovoked. You might not think you're provoking them, but they have no reason to risk their lives unless they perceive there being a risk. So these are all defensive behaviors on their part. This is a different situation than uh, mosquitoes and ticks and bed bugs that are actively seeking you out for a meal or for some, some purpose. Uh, the, these social insects, the bees and wasps, basically only sting you when they, when they feel threatened. So Texans know fire ants. They're very common in most parts of the state, but they aren't native here. They came through starting in the 70s and 80s, and they really changed a lot of the little micro landscapes. Whereas before, you could lounge around in your lawn. Once the fire ants came through, of course, they built up to such numbers that it, it, they just sort of inhabit a lot of the human landscapes now. So it's, it's much more difficult to have a, a little picnic in your, in your front yard like, like it used to be. Fire ants also, like these other social insects, they sting defensively, but because they're, they're so small and their nests can be inconspicuous, you might not know that you've just stepped on a nest of fire ants. So they come out uh, trying to convince you to move away. And they do so by both biting and stinging. Now the bite doesn't hurt, it's just a little pinch. But if you look closely at a fire ant, the first thing she does when she's biting, and it is a she that, that, that does this, um, she latches onto your skin with her, her, her jaws and anchors herself. And that's just a little pinch, but she's giving herself leverage to plant the sting, and the sting is at the other end of her body. Um, and that's what hurts. A sting is an, an injection of venom, whereas a bite is merely an anchoring uh, sort of pinch. They have a, they're called fire ants because of, the, because of the, the, the feeling that a sting gives you. You rarely get stung by just one fire ant. You tend to encounter them in groups. And so typically when you're stung by fire ants, you're stung by an, an awful lot. They'll swarm really quickly up your leg and then they'll all bite and sting and you get a series of a bunch of stings that individually aren't that painful, but in a group can really, <laughs> can really feel like a burning sensation. So they're called fire ants. And unlike most stings, uh, the sting develops into a very distinct pustule. Um, and it's one of the best ways to diagnose that you've had a fire ant sting is just to look for that characteristic pustule or often series of them if you've been stung by a lot. I wouldn't pop it just for the infection risk. Um, one of the main risks of any insect sting is not actually the sting or the venom, but the risk that scratching it will open a wound that can become infected. So if you've survived the initial sting and you aren't allergic, um, sometimes the best reaction to a sting is just let it be. You can put some ice on it to cool it down, but the venom's already in there doing its thing. Just let your body uh, detoxify the venom and don't scratch it because that could lead to infection. Scorpions. Um, scorpions are one of these sort of overstated risks. There are some states in the United States that have potentially dangerous scorpions, but in central Texas, uh, our scorpions, while they can, can sting and be, be somewhat painful, a bit like a wasp sting, they, they pose no real health risk um, apart from potential allergic responses. Scorpions inject uh, a neurological toxin that messes with how nerves communicate. And so it's sort of a, a painful muscle relaxing type thing. Um, but they're not dangerous per se, it's just the sort of thing that, that hurts for a while. Scorpions are incidental in homes. You'll mostly encounter them outdoors, under rocks, under bark, that sort of thing. Occasionally, you'll get, you'll get ones that wander inside. It's, again, not their ideal habitat, but they'll be in there maybe eating crickets and other things, little cockroaches that are in your home. Um, if it weren't for the sting, we'd probably regard scorpions as being a net benefit as they're, they're preying on things in, in, in our house. But again, here in central Texas, um, kind of a nuisance in that they might sting, but not a real danger. Spiders are a wonderful group. There are thousands of spiders in Central Texas, thousands of species of spiders in, in Central Texas. And they are almost entirely harmless or beneficial as a group. 
Um, there are only two species of medical importance. Uh, they are the brown recluse and the black widow that have different types of venom. But even there, the danger of these two species is vastly overstated. Um, the, any medical cases in Texas of serious recluse and, uh, and, and uh, black widow bites are very, very rare. Um, these are animals that, again, um, do not go out of their way to find you. Bites from spiders tend to be situations where the, the person who's being bitten has in some way cornered or even squished a spider. A spider bite, which is a very rare thing, is a last ditch effort by the spider to keep from getting squished. And many bites don't even inject venom. Um, a lot of spider bites are simply dry. Um, so there's not, there's not a, a, a real big risk from spiders. Having said that, uh, it's worth knowing that the, the black widow has a, a neurotoxin in its venom, which can be quite painful, but um, unless uh, you're really small, really frail, this doesn't present much of a danger. Uh, they can cause the typical symptoms there are horrible abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, uh, maybe even rigidity, uh, and just particularly a rigid abdomen. Uh, the key treatment for that in the field is going to be similar to the treatment in the emergency department. Uh, treat the symptoms, treat their pain, and then here in the emergency department we're going to make sure there wasn't anything else going on because almost never are we going to find the spider that bit you. You can have a brown recluse bite. It uh, releases necrotic enzymes and you can have localized tissue necrosis where you just get a great big cave in the skin um, and that develops over several days to a week or so and you obviously run problems with uh, potential infection. Um, the unfortunate thing about the brown recluse is it's acquired a reputation um, that it doesn't really deserve. The, the main trouble is a lot of people have been misdiagnosing mystery wounds as spider bites because they just don't know what caused it. And studies that have actually gone through and actually dissected these mystery cases, uh, tried to figure out what caused them, conclude that in nine times out of 10, it was not actually a spider bite. These are other things. We see lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of spider bites. The catch is they're almost never spiders and they're almost never bites, they're abscesses. So we really got hung up on this and we associated spider bites with infection and the reason is because we misdiagnosed ourselves. So we'll hear a patient come in and say, well, I, had a, I got bit by a spider and I now have this big spider bite. That's interesting, tell me more. The main thing we wanna know is, did you actually see the spider? Usually we didn't. Then we look at the area and it just looks like an abscess and the cure for an abscess is steel. So we just do an incision and drainage. Uh, most of those don't even need antibiotics. Same way with spider bite, true spider bites. Most of those don't form uh, abscesses and don't cause infection. Uh, but like any bite, any break to the skin, they can cause infection. Uh, in the same way with uh, snake bites and spider bites, we want to make sure their tetanus is up to date and just do good localized wound care. The reality is that spiders don't, don't pose that much of a risk to people, certainly not compared to the, uh, the stinging insects. Uh, there is anti-venom for the black widow, which is a, a neurotoxin, although again, widow bites are fairly rare, so it's not, uh, not something that, that most people will, will worry about. Just don't pick them up. <laughs> uh, even then, people who pick up widows rarely get bitten. The things that require anti-venom are usually things that inject enough to provoke a severe toxic response. Things like, uh, things like rattlesnakes will give you a, a, a substantial amount of venom. I mean, Ounce for ounce, honeybee venom is much more toxic than rattlesnake venom. It's just that a single bee only gives you a little tiny bit. A rattlesnake is injecting these, quite a lot of it, and so that's the sort of thing that's gonna need some anti-toxicity. Um, it's gonna need some, an anti-venom. Whereas uh, the quantities involved for stinging insects is not, not great. Places like Australia that have abundant venomous native wildlife tend to have lots of centers and local health clinics will stock anti-venom as a result. Uh, Texas does not have uh, much that's dangerous on an Australia level of things. Uh, insect anti-venoms here are not really an issue just because our, even our venomous spiders aren't so, aren't so severe. If you want to worry about the, the quantity of stinging and the anaphylaxis. Um, um, a good sign for anaphylaxis, by the way, is uh, 
how quickly the response sets in. So if you have someone who's experiencing uh, some kind of a reaction, a rash that's far from the sting site, a tingling in the ears, an itchiness in the throat, if that happens within 10 to 15 minutes of the sting, that often indicates a more severe response to follow. Whereas if that gets a little rash or tingling half an hour or more beyond, that usually indicates something more minor. So you really want to pay attention to how quickly after the sting these allergic responses start. Because that, again, is the main danger for all these insect envenomations is the small percentage of people that are allergic. Treating anaphylaxis from bees or wasps or fire ants or even scorpions is exactly like treating, treating anaphylaxis from anything else. The problem is increased vascular permeability and increased vasodilation. All of that causes hypotension, uh, third spacing of fluids. The treatment for it is epinephrine, 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 and there's one more. That's right, epinephrine. Give more of it because that directly goes to both the problems. It helps treat the vascular permeability and it helps treat the vasodilation uh, by causing some constriction. Probably the biggest error we make in treating uh, stings, but treating any type of allergic reaction is we're hesitant to commit to giving epinephrine. We give the epinephrine and then we're hesitant to give more epinephrine. Epinephrine is for the most part a benign drug. Again, the other things to worry about are infection, tetanus, uh, and we'll take care of that. An unfortunate common human response to insects and spiders is to kill them when they see them. And I don't advise it, especially don't kill it with fire. <laughs> you hear that a lot. Um, there are a lot of cases of death and injury that result not from anything the insect did, but from an overreaction to the presence of an insect. Car crashes because there's a spider in the car, not really the fault of the spider. Um, if you have bed bugs in your house, contact a licensed pest professional. Don't set fire to your mattress. Um, don't set fire to your car. There's always a story about once a month of someone burning a car down because they're trying to do, make a homemade flamethrower for bed bugs. <laughs> um, leave treatment of the insects to people who know what they're doing and, and don't take that into your own hands. Yeah, if you absolutely have to, call Russell Richter for pest control. <laughs> <laughs>